Okay, here's our next chapter, probability and samples. So please keep in mind all the stuff you learned about in the previous chapters with order of operations, everything you know about Z scores and a unit normal table. Location of a score in a sample or in a population can be represented with a Z score. Okay? But the issue with Z scores is you're only looking at one score, one person's you know, raw score. And researchers want to study whole samples rather than just you know, single scores or single individuals. So samples provide an estimate, a better estimate of the population. And to study a whole sample, it involves transforming the sample mean you know, as a group um, to a z-score. And that's what this chapter is going to go over. So kind of keep in the back of your mind this whole idea about sampling error. In the very beginning of the, of the class, we talked about how samples are not exactly the same as populations. And that's okay. We don't expect a sample to have exactly what the population has. But it should mirror um, the population pretty well. So um, what, when we're trying to do a study, when we're trying to research something, you really should look at getting a sample that's pretty representative of, of the population. But also understand that there is going to be sampling error. And the sampling error doesn't necessarily mean that um, the researcher messed up or that you made a mistake. It's just this natural discrepancy or difference between um, the sample statistic and its corresponding population parameter. And just like humans are variable and individual and unique, samples are also variable. No two samples are identical. Okay. So some of the distributions we talked about in previous chapters were dist distributions of sample scores. Okay. So a distribution of sample means is a sampling distribution, meaning we've been talking about single scores, now we're going to move to groups of scores. Um, and this distribution of statistics is obtained by selecting all the possible samples of a specific size, um, n, from, from a specific population. Okay, so take a look at this chart here. So we're going to try to take into consideration all the random sampling that um, of two for the population of raw scores of two, four, six, and eight. Okay, so take a look on the top left-hand corner here. Um, we have the first choice is two. So no matter what we go with, you have to pick two first. Well, I can get two and two, right? My mean will be two. I can pick two and four. And my mean would then be three because I'm just going to add two and four together to get six, divide by two and get three. I can get um, a random sample of two and six, right? Divide those or well add those together and then divide them, and you're going to get an average of 4. 2 and 8 will give me a mean of 5. Now, if my second, my first choice is 4, I can go 4 and 2, 4 and 4, 4 and 6, 4 and 8. Same thing here. If my first choice is 6, I can go 6 and 2, 6 and 4, 6 and 6, and 6 and 8, until I'm left with only my first choice being 8, when I can do pairings of 8 and 2, 8 and 4, 8 and 6, and 8 and 8. Um, the next slide is going to show you graphically what this looks like. So let's go there. Okay, so we have our original scores, 2, 4, 6, and 8. And if you add 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8, you get um, 20. 20 divided by 4 is, is 5, so we have an average score of 5. Remember how we said like um, you can only have 1, 2, and 2, right? You can only have 1, um, 2, and eight, right? So, or um, yeah, when you have one pairing of eight and then one pairing of, of two, and what's happening here is it's going to pile up around the, the top here, right? So our sampling mean again is five. So it's just what it looks like graphically. Um, that that distribution of sample means, and again, we're not going to necessarily look at um, individual scores, right? Because how did we get two? How did we get a sampling mean of two? We added. 2 plus 2, and then divided by 2, so we got 2, right? Or we got 2 and 2 is 4, and then divided by 2 is, is 2. Same thing here, we added um, 8 and 8, so 16 divided by 2 is 8 again, where um, up here you have lots of different varieties, you can get an average of 5. Okay, again, so the sample mean piles up around the population mean, and the distribution of the sample mean should be approximately normal, so it should mirror that population shape pretty close. Central limit theorem. This is a big theory we talk about in statistics a lot. And it applies to any population with a mean and a standard deviation. Okay. 
Now, if you don't have, if you have like an unknown, unknown mean, unknown variation, we can do a t-test, and that's in the upcoming chapters. But with a central limit theorem, this is whenever we have um, knowledge of when we know what the mean is and the standard deviation is. Okay, and the distribution of sample means um, approaches normal, right? When n approaches infinity, and statisticians think that infinity is 30, anything greater than 30. So if you can get 30 people in a room and they're randomly sampled, they should approximate that norm. And then distribution of sample means for samples of size n will have a standard deviation of that standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Okay. And you can assume that your distribution of sample means is normal, right, or almost perfectly normal, if it can meet one of these two conditions. One, the population from which the samples are selected is known to be a normal distribution. Or two, the number of scores in each sample is relatively large, right, so passing that 30 mark. You don't have to reach both. Um, if the population um, uh, is unknown, like the distribution is unknown, then as long as you pump up your sample size, you should be okay. Expected value of the mean. The mean of distribution of sample means is equal to the mean of the population of scores, the mu, meaning that the, the estimated or the expected value of the mean should equal whatever that population mu is, or at least we assume it is, right? Because if you're not, then again, you're cherry picking. If you're saying, I invented a smart pill and my smart pill is gonna increase your IQ, really high, like one or two standard deviations above the average. And you go to get your sample outside a Mensa meeting, right, for this, the club for smart people, um, you're not really getting a sample that's approximating that population average, right? You should go um, to some junior highs, you should go to some high schools, you can go to Mensa, that's fine, but as long as you go to um, a center that has um, that helps people with developmental delays or disabilities, right? So you have to get this good random sampling. So again, this um, expected value of the mean should be whatever the mu is. Okay, let's take a look. So if you have a population with a mu of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, what is the expected value of the mean for a sample of six scores? Okay. Now I could have stopped talking when I said if you have a population with a mu of 100. If you know your population mu is 100, that's your expected value of the mean, 100. Okay, standard error of the mean. Um, the standard error of the mean is um, this right here, so it looks like the standard deviation with an m down below, so that little o sub m, right? And the standard error of the mean is the variability of scores, right, so how much the scores um, differ from one another, measured by the standard deviation of the sample scores. Okay. And again, it's going to be notated with um, the standard error of the mean um, equals um, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Okay. Law of large numbers and population variance. So the larger the sample size, the more probable it is that the sample mean will be close to population mean. And this makes sense, right? So say I have a lecture hall and it has 150 students in it. And I say, I want to see what the average average height of my student is, right? And I take a, a sample of five people and I measure them. And, you know, and I get a number. But what if I measured 10 people? That would be better, right? Than if I measured 50 people. What if I measured 100 people out of 150? Do you see how my increasing my sample size makes it so that I would think that, that sample size would be more like my population until I get all the way up to measuring all 150 of my students because then I have no you know, sampling error because my sample size is the population size. So law of large numbers means that the larger you can create your group, your research group, the participants that are you know, being um, studied in, in your research, um, the more probable that that sample mean will be close to that population mean. Okay. Population variance. The greater the variance in the population, the less probable it is that the sample mean will be close to the population mean. Okay. So if you have 
your dean come to you and you say, I need to get, um, or my dean comes to me and says, I need to have uh, a sampling of your uh, last quiz that you gave the students. I want to see what they look like. Well, if my variance, right, if I had some students score in the 90s and one person like aced, just got 100%, and I have some students that got 50s and 40s and 70s and in the teens and in the 90s, they're all over the place. If he only pulls, um, you know, five or six students, so he's violating that law of large numbers, he's not going to probably get a very good, reliable sample mean. Right, it's not going to look like the population because the scores are all over the place. Could he pull five people that all got A's? He could, right? Could he pull five people that all got F's? Absolutely, right? So, but consider the opposite. So if I have small variance, if all my students scored in the 80s, right, the, the range was between like 82 and 87. If he pulls five students, he's pretty much going to find everyone's going to be in the 80s still, right? So the greater the variance of the population, the less probable it is that the sample mean will be close to the population mean. All right. The primary use of the distribution of sample means is to find the probability associated with any particular sample. So think back to z-scores. Remember we talked about z-scores and I was like, okay, well, what's the probability that I'm going to pull a single score randomly that's going to be above a z-score of 0.4? Right? We're doing the exact same thing, but now we're just doing groups of people versus just one person. Okay? So again, the proportions of the normal curve are used, and um, you can compute um, from a raw score, get a z-score, from that z-score you can get a probability or proportion. Okay. Population has a mu of 60 with a standard deviation of 5. The distribution of sample means for the samples of size is, is 4. Right. Um, Selected from this population would have an expected value of the mean of what? Think back. What should your expected value of the mean be if you know that your population mu is 60? You should assume that your sample mean is like your population mu. Okay, true or false? The distribution of sample means is always normal shaped. So we'll still pause and then come back. False. It's normal shaped if the population is normal or the sample size is greater than 30, 30 or greater. Okay. True or false. As sample size increases, the value of the standard error decreases. This is true. The sample size is the denominator of the equation. So as you are creating a larger and larger and larger sample size, what's going to happen to your standard error is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until you have study the entire population, right? And then you're going to have zero standard error or sampling error. Okay, so we have, um, again, sampling error is just that natural discrepancy between the sampling mean and the true population. And so the amount of sampling error varies. So again, how to find your um, standard error, your sampling error is um, standard deviation divided by that square root of n. All right, take a look at these. So these are distribution of sample means. Now, in this first one over here on the left-hand side, you just have one, right? Your sample size was one. Look at your standard error, 20. Look what happens when you start pumping up that sample size, when you, when you quadruple it into four, right? Your standard error you know, goes in half. And then look when you have a standard or 100 people in your study. Now your standard error is only two. So as you're increasing the, the sample size, your um, sampling error, your standard error decreases. So population has a standard deviation of 20. On average, how much difference should exist between the population mean and the mean distribution for samples of four scores randomly selected from the population? So use your equation. Use your standard error equation. And then we'll work through it together. Okay, so standard error equals um, standard deviation divided by square root of n, right? So you have standard deviation 20 and you square root of uh, four scores, so 20 divided by 2. And so your standard um, error is, is 10, or you can, you can expect to see a difference of 10 points or so. Okay, so up at this point, we're using the z-score to find locations of raw scores or individual scores in population.
And we've been using this one right here. So z equals mean minus mu divided by standard deviation. Now, because we're going to deal with groups of people, so sample sizes, right, we're going to substitute the population standard deviation with a standard error. Okay, so you're going to have one more step. So now your distribution of sample means to find that z for that entire group is going to be mean minus mu divided by your, est right, divided by your standard error. Let's take a look. Population forms a normal distribution with a mu of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. A sample of 25 scores of the population has a mean of 55. Would this sample be described as relatively typical? Or would we describe this mean as extreme? So again, population mu is 50 with a standard deviation of 10. And you grab 25 scores from that population, and they all together, when you put all their scores together, they're going to have an average score of 55. So would that be considered extreme or typical? Well, let's go through it. So again, we have our standard error um, is a standard deviation divided by square root of n. We're going to put that into our new modified z equation there. Okay, so we find um, 10, all right, standard deviation divided by how many people we had in our study, 25. So 10 divided by um, 5 basically is 2. We then throw that 2 that we got from right here into the denominator of our new z. All right, so now mean of the new group, 55, minus the mu of the population group, 50, divided by 2. So 2.5. So think back. So when we talked about our z, right, and we had that unit normal table, um, zero was in the middle, and the positive numbers were on the right-hand side, and the negative numbers were on the left-hand side. Getting a z-score of 2.5, would you think that's extreme or typical? Let's look at it graphically. So again, we have our original population distribution here, right? And we have our mean of 50, or mu of 50. Now we have this new group, and they're way over here with a z-score of 2.5. That's way out there, right? If you look at your um, unit normal table, right, you'll see that's just really far over there. So inferential statistics uses um, sample data, so stuff that we learn about a sample, and we're going to try to draw general conclusions, right? conclusions for the population from those um, samples that we ran studies on. You know, again, sample is not perfectly accurate re reflection of the population. It's going to vary. right? Um, each sample you know, is going to be different. And the differences between the sample and the population reduce uncertainty, right? that sampling error. Um, so statistics. One of the techniques we use is, is probability, and through probability, we can help draw inferences from that sample data. Okay, so learning check. A random sample of 16 scores is obtained from a population with a mu of 50 and a standard deviation of 16. If the sample mean is 58, what is the z-score corresponding to that sample mean? So do your two-step process. First, find your standard, standard error. Your standard, yeah, your standard error, and then throw it into your new modified z equation. You have a z of 2. Okay. True or false? A sample mean with a z-score of 3 is a fairly typical representative sample. No. A z-score of 0, right, would be a typical representative. This a 3 is extreme or very unlikely. Okay. Um, please remember to do your homework and um, text me or email with any questions. Thank you.